Hello and welcome to The Vaccine. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Well, we were warned to expect higher case numbers with the arrival of Omicron and it has eventuated. New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia are all reporting new records in case numbers. Some states have responded with further control measures, but others have this week relaxed the rules. New South Wales has done away with mask mandates in shopping centres and hospitality venues, while Queensland is reintroducing them in some settings. The Prime Minister says we're now in a different phase of the pandemic. We can't go back to lockdowns. We all know that. Right from the start of this pandemic, we have always sought to balance saving lives and saving livelihoods, and we almost always must protect lives and protect livelihoods. And that remains our goal. So some communities are still vulnerable because of low vaccination rates. The Northern Territory town of Tennant Creek has again gone into an immediate three-day lockdown after new cases were detected there. Australian health authorities are speaking with their counterparts overseas to try to learn as much as possible about Omicron. The UK, one of the many countries experiencing a surge, is seeing almost 90,000 cases a day. And while we can expect more infections here, the chief medical officer is urging us not to focus on that particular figure. The most important thing is to look what that does for the health system. Um, particularly hospitalisations, particularly the intensive care, but also our primary care system. That's important that we do uh, uh, plot that and we've made lots of plans about how to surge in that, in, that, in that regard. So how will the health system cope? Associate Professor Doug Johnson is an infectious diseases physician and head of medicine at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. He joins us now. Uh, Dr Johnson, thanks for joining us. What shape is our hospital system in right now? Yeah, thanks Jeremy. So Currently, the situation remains definitely under control. We're, we're at much lower levels than we were a couple of months ago. At the moment, we've got 15 patients on our wards at Royal Melbourne and only eight in ICU and around 80 on home monitoring. And that's very different to what we were a couple of months ago when we were over 100 patients uh, on our wards. Um, all our staff are, are double vaccinated and most are um, boosted or have got triple vaccination. We're certainly encouraging all of our staff to have that done. Um, our hospital is very prepared. We've got obviously very high numbers in the community, but at the moment that's not impacting our hospitals, which is fantastic. Uh, we've learnt a lot over the last 18 months, so we're prepared and in fact we're meeting daily on how we might prepare if the numbers do increase and we're expecting they will increase. Um, our staff are experienced and, it's, and now it's very safe and it feels very safe on the wards. We've got very good PPE, we've got very good ventilation and very good measures of infection control from staff safety point of view, but also fantastic treatment options for patients who do come in with COVID. Um, I think, you know, we've learnt a lot with the various variants that have come through and we know that things change and things change rapidly. So we're waiting for more info about Omicron, but certainly the, the early signals are, as, as we all know, that it's very transmissible. Uh, People certainly need their boosters. There's a lot of data now coming out of England and elsewhere that two doses, uh, your, your, your protection or your immunity will wane after about three to five months. And so we're very keen for people to have their boosters, both our staff as well as patients, and particularly those who are elderly and with comorbidities, we, we think it's critical that they get boosters. So I guess in summary, Jeremy, to say that the hospital currently is coping extremely well. We've got very good systems. We've got uh, lots of options to increase our capacity as required. Um, and we've got now a lot of treatment options, but prevention via boosting with vaccination remains the key. Are you learning any useful lessons from overseas at this point? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're all in contact with colleagues, both in Europe and the US, um, who are seeing you know, very large numbers, both in the community, but also increased hospitalisation. Um, and as I mentioned, that problem or that that need to have a booster has really been the key. There's some of our treatments that are still uh, very effective with both Delta and Omicron. Some of the monoclonal antibodies, we've learned that uh, one in particular is still very effective, whereas the others may be waning in their protection. So we've learned a lot from overseas. And, and I guess that's been one of the, um, the benefits of being in Australia and being able to learn what's happened overseas before it comes to Australia. So we've had time to prepare both uh, with previous ways, but also with this way. How great is the risk of exposure for a patient or a staff member in hospital right now, given the scale and transmissibility of Omicron? 
Yeah, so we so all of our staff um, are in uh, N95 masks and face shields. So, uh, and when they're looking after patients who've got COVID or suspect suspected COVID in a, what we call tier three PPE, so we're not seeing transmission between staff members like we did last year. We also have much better uh, understanding of the transmission and, and the need for uh, ventilation. So all of our rooms have been assessed for their adequacy of ventilation and we have HEPA filtration units in all the in, in all the rooms and all the corridors. So we just haven't seen the transmission between staff members that we did last year with more understanding. And along with that, similar uh, experiences with our patients that all of our patients get tested regardless of their presentation on, on uh, when they when they arrive in our emergency department. So every patient's tested. Um, and we're very uh, mindful of the risk of transmission to other staff, oh, sorry, to other patients. And that hasn't been a, a significant problem this year, where it, whereas it was in previous waves last year. We're heading into the festive season, the summer season. A lot of people are getting out of mountain mingling. What's the best way for us to head off some of those doomsday scenarios of tens of thousands of cases a day in Australia? If you can do your, uh, your social functions, uh, outside, that's extremely you know, beneficial for reducing the risk of transmission. If you have any symptoms or you're unwell, please get tested. Um, so it's really about trying to remain with that social isolation of being outside uh, rather than indoors, wearing masks where appropriate as per your state recommendations. And uh, both when it becomes available for children, we're, we're very keen for children to be vaccinated between five and 11, but particularly people to get boosted and particularly those with comorbidities or those with higher risk of, of severe disease. Dr Doug Johnson, thank you. No worries, thanks for your time. Professor Sharon Lewin is the director of the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity. She joins us now. Professor, thanks for joining us. You've consistently said that we should expect the unexpected with COVID. How concerned are you about these exposure sites and surging infections of Omicron right now? Well, I think we need to be really cautious and watch this closely. At the moment, um, there are lots of unknowns about Omicron. But what we're learning is that in other countries, particularly South Africa, Omicron appears to cause milder disease. South Africa is, of course, a very different environment to Australia. However, we have a very large number of Australians vaccinated and very recently vaccinated, which is a good thing. However, the increasing numbers are, of course, a concern because even if Omicron is much milder, a small percentage of a very large number of infections means more people in the hospital system, which is what our biggest concern is. How much does waning immunity play into the issue right now and, um, you know, the booster program slowly rolling out across the country? Well, there are two issues here. There is, first of all, Omicron itself, which is less... Uh, sensitive to neutralisation, meaning that you need high levels of antibodies to eliminate Omicron. So first of all, Omicron needs higher antibodies. And then we also know that after a period of several months from your second dose of vaccine, your immunity wanes, which means that your levels of antibodies decrease. So boosters definitely help. Boosters will increase antibody levels about 25 fold and get it in the range that Omicron needs. However, when we give boosters, we're balancing two things. We're balancing boosting up your antibodies and also the safety. And we have a lot of safety data on boosters at five months after the second dose. We don't have a lot of safety data after two to three months of the second dose. So the recommendations at the moment, and they may well change, is that given what we know about the safety at five months, where it's very safe, and given what we know about antibody levels, the recommendation is to have boosters at five months. Um, now, the UK have chosen to go for a shorter period, but they are, don't have that information on safety at three months at the moment. And also, they've got a very different situation being in the middle of winter than what we are in summer. So these are tricky decisions to be made. But at the moment, the recommendation is a booster at five months, unless you're immunosuppressed, and then the recommendations are your booster should come at two months. 
At the same time that all this is unfolding, restrictions are being eased in certain parts of the country. Masks are optional in most circumstances. We're told by governments that vaccination rates will hold the line with Omicron. The Prime Minister says we're in the new phase of the pandemic, that lockdowns aren't really on the cards right now. How much can you say with any certainty that we are over with lockdowns, over with masks, over with social distancing? Well, I think all of those three things are actually very, very different public health measures. They're all in the toolbox, but they have a very wide range of impact. So lockdowns, extreme high level impact. We want to avoid that at all costs. Masks and distancing, you know, not less of an impact. I mean, having lived with masks for many months now in Melbourne, you know, it's not a big deal, really. I, I know that it's inconvenient, but it's a small intervention with potential added protection from infection. So I think those three things we will use in different ways. And as you've seen across the country, different states have made, have made different calls on that extra level of protection that you might have for masks in certain settings. And I think that can be really confusing to people because why don't you wear it in New South Wales, but yet we're wearing masks in retail in Victoria. And this does cause confusion. I personally think while there's a little bit of uncertainty about Omicron, the addition of masks in some settings, such as retail, makes sense to me, but there are still many unknowns. Uh, there have been a couple of reports this week suggesting that New South Wales could hit 25,000 cases a day by the end of January, a million cases a day in the UK, uh, that the uh, infection rate was such that it was doubling every four days. Will that eventuate? How worried should we be if that were to be the case? Well, first of all, Australia is in a very different situation to the UK. So we've got one of the highest rates of vaccination in the world, you know, in, in New South Wales, up around 93, 94%. We've recently vaccinated, as opposed to many parts of the world, such as the UK and Europe, which means your antibody levels are high. And we have a universal booster program that's being rolled out right now with widespread access to boosters. And we're in summer. So all of that will have a big impact on the levels of infections that we're going to see. So I do think we're in a different situation in Australia to the UK. However, those very large numbers are concerning because large numbers of infections can translate to an impact on our healthcare system. However, we're still learning about Omicron. Our data largely comes from South Africa, which is actually a very different community to Australia. South Africa has a lot of people that had past infection and very few people that are vaccinated. We have a lot of people that have vaccination and very few with past infection. So we will learn a lot over the coming weeks and that will dictate the best public health response. But I think at the moment there are lots in our favour in Australia. We know that variants are more likely to evolve in under-vaccinated populations. Where is the global vaccination drive at at the moment and what impact could Australia possibly have when you consider the scale of that task? We still have a major, major problem with access and uptake of vaccination, particularly in lower middle income countries, primarily Africa. Less than 6% of the African continent have been vaccinated and over 70% of high income countries have been vaccinated. That's just a huge imbalance. It's a matter of supply, but it's not all supply. I was um, hearing recently that in South Africa, a maid, only 25% of people are double vaccinated and a major issue is still vaccine hesitancy and a lack of trust in the vaccines. So I think Australia could have a major contribution in two ways, of course, to assist with supply by purchasing vaccines and contributing to the international coalition called COVAX, but also funding programs around vaccine hesitancy and implementation. Even in a country like Australia, high income country, high levels of education, implementation hasn't been that easy. And we have counterbalanced vaccine hesitancy, I think very well given the numbers we've achieved. So we should make a big commitment to investing in programs to assist countries that really are suffering from major issues around misinformation and vaccine hesitancy. Professor Lewin, it's so good to hear from you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks very much, Jeremy. And that is the show for this week and this year. Thank you for watching. We'll be back in 2022. In the meantime, stay safe 
Have a happy Christmas and New Year. Bye for now.